So I thought I'd take us on a journey across the Atlantic Ocean to Canada to, to finish off um, and focus on how we translate um, ideas of design governance and best practice. So I'll begin by talking about best practice and precedence um, in planning and urban design. I'll then introduce Vancouverism, which is a widely uh, cited example of a best practice urban design formula. I'll briefly explore a theoretical idea of policy mobility. Um, and then I'll turn to the case study that I've been looking at for about 10 years, which is located in uh, Toronto in Canada, and explain how Vancouverism was mobilized by a Vancouver developer to that city. And then I'll come back to the broader themes from that case and reflect on whether best practices actually travel very well um, and what we might learn from this particular uh, example. Learning from best practice um, is, is a common refrain uh, in, in urban design and in architecture. And as practitioners, we have, we have long traveled to new places to, to learn about innovative methods. Um, it's often the excuse for going to a conference to go and check out an interesting city somewhere. And, it, and this global flow of ideas is it, it, made easier by affordable air travel, the globalization of the design profession, and of course the internet, which also allows us um, speedy virtual exchanges. And then we can also see things now on Street View and other tools without even having to visit. And the value that's placed on best practice is also more fundamentally underpinned by the uh, teaching, or I, I have trouble saying this word, the pedagogical um, tradition of using precedent studies in our design education to encourage students to look elsewhere, to learn, and to take those ideas. And there's just a few of the types of places, Barcelona, High Line in New York, Copenhagen, that we, that we tend typically to look at. And Vancouver, um, located on Canada's west coast, is of course one of these best practices that people visit. Its renown is centered upon its urban renaissance that occurred principally on the downtown peninsula of that city between the late 1980s and the 2010s. And if I click the slide, hopefully this will work, you can see the stark transformation um, that occurred on that, on that water, in that waterfront city, a massive residential um, renaissance. And this transformation has since been termed and I hate to use an ism, I apologize, but it has been termed Vancouverism. And a simple physical definition focuses on the tower podium model, which combines these slender, uh, tall condominium towers with two to three storey um, grade townhouses. And this is accompanied by high quality private amenity space for the residents of those buildings within the blocks um, and, and generous public spaces in between, including the seawall, which you can see on the top picture and indeed the picture below. And these two images showcase in particular the work of one developer, which is Concord Pacific, a Hong Kong family, Vancouver, Canadian-based developer. And they were key to delivering elements of Vancouverism on the downtown peninsula, and we'll hear more about them um, in a little while. But it would be remiss if we were to just think of Vancouverism as a design product. Uh, the term also encompasses the wider urban design process in that city characterized by a sophisticated design review system that's embedded into planning decision making for major projects, a strong and agreed vision for the city that's design based and which guides decision making, and a thoroughgoing public participation process. Uh, and also judicious leadership uh, is also important here. During the 90s and early 2000s, the, the co-head of planning, Larry Beasley, who you can see on the screen there, and his team were effective negotiators with the private sector, um, like developers like Concord, um, and, and they worked with them, them well, although they received some criticism for some of their actions. Now, it was local journalists and commentators who were first to use the term Vancouverism, but it's since become a, an, this mobile policy concept. Um, elements of Vancouver's built form have been produced uh, first locally in cities like Seattle, who look for advice, and San Diego, and then further afield to places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So this is a, a recreation of Vancouverism here on the screen in the Dubai Marina. And Vancouver developers, architects, planning consultants, 
have kind of discovered a global market for their skills and expertise. Larry Beasley's book coming out this year called Vancouverism, an exhibition in London in 2010. Um, and we have um, the other heads of planning who are, uh, tweet a lot and travel the world and give talks. But what is meant by a mobile policy? And I think uh, theory helps us here. Um, so a few longer words for a second. Uh, the, the, the concept of, of urban policy mobilization uh, assumes a relational understanding of policy movement that focuses on how policies and ideas alter and adjust as they circulate through the complex socio-spatial networks around the world. So how do they travel? How do they change? How do they, do they mutate? They don't typically transfer from one place to another seamlessly. In this sense, planning and ideas like Vancouverism or indeed Barcelona planning or Copenhagen, Jan Gale planning are all said to travel around the world as complex assemblages. They combine images, uh, visual images like I'm showing you of urban form, but also particular techniques, legal arrangements and cultures of practice. So with this in mind, I'll, I'll share with you for the, for the last half of the talk um, uh, the research I've been doing with, with, with my colleague John Punter, which is, first, we asked two questions, really. How is Vancouverism mobilized between Vancouver and Toronto, which is another Canadian city, obviously? And then what actually happens when a concept um, that's mixed between process and product is purported to be adapted elsewhere? And I'll turn to Toronto, a former brownfield railway yard called City Place, um, which was purchased by Concord ADEX, you might recognize that name, in 1997. And they are a wholly owned subsidiary of Concord Pacific, who were the developer that I mentioned a few slides ago. And City Place is an interesting case study because it was the first uh, a really big scheme to emerge in what became a citywide residential condominium boom in the city of Toronto. Um, as this remarkable gift, which the uh, chief urban designer of Toronto kindly gave me, if I click, we see 2000 through 2014, all those new buildings are residential that just appeared on the screen out of nowhere. So a massive condominium boom. And City Place is located in the immediate foreground here. Brownfield site on the waterfront. But there's a big elevated highway in the way. So as part of the bidding process for the site in 1996, Concord stated it, that there was their intention to seek changes to the existing medium rise master plan that had been produced by the city of Toronto to accommodate this, the Vancouver style podium model, which by this time in 1997 was actually beginning to attract interest from planners and urban designers from outside Vancouver. Concord also promised to bring its Vancouver's ar architects with it, um, and, you know, if they were successful, the people that had delivered it. And they won this bidding process, an international competition, um, local, uh, central government looking to sell off, um, to sell off public lands. And they, they took Toronto's planners with them to Vancouver after they'd won the bidding process, and they gave them a tour um, and, and showed them how the Vancouver model worked. And Toronto planners recall being incredibly impressed with what they saw, rather jealous, actually, of, of the quality of public space. And they worked then quite happily with Concord to produce a revised planning framework for the site that would accommodate this tower podium model. I won't get all into all the details, but suffice to say, this followed 25 years of arguing about what was going to happen on this site. And then remarkably, in one year after a visit to a successful project, they were very happy to change the planning framework, which is quite interesting. And we see these plans on the screen, an upshot in density as well, so the developer was quite happy with that. So the early blocks in, in Toronto that were built between 2000 and 2003, to some extent, resemble the quality buildings that that same company had built in Vancouver. But the commentary was rather critical. There was a feeling that the built, forming, the built form that Toronto had approved was a bit taller, a little bulkier, the materials were a bit cheaper than what had been built in Vancouver. And city planners admitted to me when we talked about it that they were perhaps a little bit naive about what Concord would deliver when it came to a different city. The city was also disappointed that that promise of Vancouver architects never really materialized and some rather um, large corporate firms that were based in Toronto ended up designing the buildings. To reinforce this point, we can kind of see it on the screen a bit here. 
the quality, I mean, it's subtle, but the quality here, the top picture is Vancouver. It's a little bulkier, the buildings are a bit closer together, the streetscape doesn't quite work as well. It's a little bit clearer in this image. On the next slide, to reinforce the point, we see the difference in the street treatment. You know, in Vancouver, the integration of an underground parking lot is done extremely well. In Toronto, it's done a bit more like we're used to. It kind of, it kind of doesn't work very well, and the podium's a little bit awkward. And again, the ground plane of the building, this is the ground planes in Toronto. In, we see, yes, the townhouses are integrated. That doesn't look too bad, but the spaces right next to them, they're not quite got the quality that was very reminiscent of the Vancouver precedent. So concerns about all this um, in the early blocks led to a new collaborative design process, in, in a sense, an informal process of engagement between the developer. The developer didn't like the press they were getting. The city wanted to see a better project. And as a result of this collaboration, they produced new guidelines. These retained a commitment to the tower podium model, but they also included proposals for a, a stronger street wall, a taller street wall without the townhouses, a shift away from the model and an increase in, develop, an, an increase in density, which is the kind of negotiating point, which the developer, as you can imagine, was very pleased about. The built form actually improved a little bit as a result of this oversight. The towers on the latter blocks are generally of a, of a higher urban um, design quality, but they are still taller, they are still bulkier, they have a higher floor plate than the Vancouver precedent. Um, but we can see in these images, you know, an emergence of a different form that's beginning to, di it's looking very different from the Vancouver precedent as the development goes on. This is sort of in the second phase of the development. And then as we go another sort of five or six years later, as the development was finishing, there we go, um, into the final blocks, the blocks begin to open out. So where there was an enclosed perimeter block with, um, with, with, uh, with townhouses around it, now the public could pass through the middle of the block. So the, block, the, the, the design has evolved from 97 to, to the present day in 2017, 18, um, and, and the Vancouver precedent has, has slowly sort of uh, changed and, 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 and mutated, um, to use the language of, of our policy mobility theorists. So I'll just finish with some thoughts, sort of bring this back to a, to a more general conclusion. Um, I could go into great laborious detail of every development site at Concord City Place. And, and if you're so inclined, when we eventually finish the book about it, you can read it in more detail. But I'll stop there in terms of the case. But think about some of these wider issues of transference. First, a best practice, uh, in this case, Vancouverism, was really crucial at the beginning because it helped secure the land purchase and the early changes to the zoning in Toronto, which allowed the developer to build a lot more buildings and make a lot more money ultimately. And in many ways, this was its kind of key role. Toronto planners and politicians were what we might call policy tourists. You know, they, they bought into the success of Vancouverism, perhaps a little uncritically. So it wasn't just Concord Pacific that were this agent in the mobilization process. The local planners, um, the politicians were, were bought into it all very much as well. And the challenge that Toronto's planners face therefore provides us a, perhaps with a, a cautionary tale for the rest of us, looking to emulate ideas from other places. Because it's important that we remember not to oversimplify the knowledge that we might glean from best practices and to avoid what a planning theorist Patsy Healy said as the crude borrowing of ideas from elsewhere. And I think what the research demonstrates, the research we've done demonstrate, is that the design governance practiced, the design governance practiced in Toronto did not stick up to that in Vancouver. So that process bit of Vancouverism was what Toronto was missing. And realizing that, the developer quickly adapted. They invested less, they got higher densities, they pushed them through the Committee of Adjustment, and you know, were able to make a lot more money. But ultimately, the developer behaved in a different way when it was presented with a new context and they weren't so wedded to Vancouverism as they suggested perhaps they were. So in that mind, when we think about the Urban Maestro project, learning from different places, sharing ideas, it's important not to think of lesson drawing as a simple linear process, whereby a good policy or design idea is successfully transplanted from one place to another. In the case examined here, the Vancouverism typology was used to stylize a complex way of producing a new place. And Eugene McCann and Kevin Ward have argued that this type of approach forgets the understanding of the complex local approach. Finally, a case of City Place, thinking about how we might use case studies in urban design, um, 
we researched it over a long period of time, which I think is a helpful exercise sometimes and not always that easy to do. And it allowed us to do what John Friedman, the planning theorist, has called a, a thick description. Um, the 20-year evolution of the development is helpful in understanding how best practices travel and then mutate over a long period of time. And this in-depth approach perhaps avoids us sanitizing the nuances of local cultures of practice that often tend to ignore when we look and borrow from elsewhere. So if we step back, we might argue that an urban design process and the wider theorization of policy mobility is a particularly useful way of understanding these forces and processes in the policy realm because with urban design we have a physical product that we can look at and we can see its physical change over time and circumstance. Uh, and, and, and really that was all I wanted to say, so I've probably gone a bit over time, but if you want to read more about what we've been doing, um, here's some papers and we hope to finish our book soon, perhaps in 2021 if we're lucky. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.